Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. To the jury, today I'm going to instruct you on the law, and tomorrow and Friday you will hear the arguments of counsel. I'm giving you copies of the instructions. There's one thing that is not in the instructions, and I want to tell you now, and that is that during, from now and through the deliberations, to the reaching of a verdict, you must leave your notes and your instructions here at court when you go home in the evening. At the end of the trial, I will allow you to take your notes and the instructions with you, but you just can't take them home during deliberations. Everyone got that? You're going to have to talk louder for. Are you having trouble hearing that? Why didn't I know that? This one picks up better. I'll get my voice here in a minute. Also, they have instructions, but they're turned face down, so when you want them to, you need to tell them to turn them over. All right, thank you. You have your, a copy of your instructions, and so you can follow along and keep them during your deliberations. You can look at them as we go along. Members of the jury, you have heard all of the evidence and you will hear the arguments of the attorneys, and it is now my duty to instruct you on the law that applies to this case. The law requires that I read the instructions to you. You will have these instructions in their written form in the jury room to refer to during your deliberations. You must base your decision on the facts and the law. You have two duties to perform. First, you must determine what facts have been proved from the evidence received in the trial and not from any other source. A fact is something proved by the evidence or by stipulation. A stipulation is an agreement between attorneys regarding the facts. Second, you must apply the law that I state to you to the facts, as you determine them, and in this way arrive at your verdict and any finding you are instructed to include in your verdict. You must accept and follow the law as I state it to you, regardless of whether you agree with it. If anything concerning the law said by the attorneys in their arguments or at any other time during the trial conflicts with my instructions on the law, you must follow my instructions. You must not be influenced by pity for or prejudice against a defendant. You must not be biased against a defendant because he has been arrested for the offense, charged with a crime, or brought to trial. None of these circumstances is evidence of guilt and you must not infer or assume from any or all of them that a defendant is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. You must not be influenced by sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion or public feeling. Both the people and the defendant have a right to expect that you will conscientiously consider and weigh the evidence, apply the law, and reach a just verdict regardless of the consequences. You each have a copy of the instructions that I am now reading to you. You may take notes on your copy, if you wish. An official copy of the instructions will be provided to the jury for use during deliberations. You should not make notes or deface the official copy in any way. If any rule, direction or idea is repeated or stated in different ways in these instructions, no emphasis is intended and you must not draw any inference because of its repetition. Do not single out any particular sentence or any individual point or instruction and ignore the others. Consider the instructions as a whole and each in light of all the others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. Statements made by the attorneys during the trial are not evidence. However, if the attorneys have stipulated or agreed to a fact, you must regard that fact as proven as to the party or parties making the stipulation. If an objection was sustained to a question, do not guess what the answer might have been. Do not speculate as to the reason for the objection. Do not assume to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it helps you to understand the answer. Do not consider for any purpose any offer of evidence that was rejected, or any evidence that was stricken by the court. Treat it as though you had never heard of it. You must decide all questions of fact in this case from the evidence received in this trial and not from any other source. When a witness has testified through a certified court interpreter, you must accept the English interpretation of that testimony even if you would have translated the foreign language differently. You must not independently investigate the facts or the law or consider or discuss facts as to which there is no evidence. This means, for example, that you must not on your own visit the scene, 
conduct experiments, or consult reference works or persons for additional information. You must not discuss this case with any other person, including, but not limited to spouses, spiritual leaders or advisors, or therapists, except a fellow juror during deliberations when all 12 of you are together in the jury room, and then only after the case is submitted to you for your decision and only when all 12 jurors are present in the jury room. Notes are only an aid to memory and should not take precedence over recollection. A juror who does not take notes should rely on his or her recollection of the evidence and not be influenced by the fact that other jurors do take notes. Notes are for the note-taker's own personal use in refreshing his or her recollection of the evidence. Finally, should any discrepancy exist between a juror's recollection of the evidence and a juror's notes, or between one juror's recollection and that of another, you may request that the court reporter read back the relevant testimony, which must prevail. The plaintiff in this matter is the people of the state of California. The defendant is Michael Joe Jackson. The defendant is accused of having committed the following crimes. In count one, the crime alleged is conspiracy to commit the crimes of extortion, false imprisonment or child abduction. The date of the alleged crime is between February 1, 2003 and March 31, 2003. The accusatory pleading also alleges the following crimes to have been committed by the defendant against Gavin Arvizo on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003. In count two, the crime alleged is lewd act upon a child. The first alleged molestation testified to by Gavin Arvizo. In count two, the crime alleged is lewd act upon a child. Excuse me. In count three, the crime alleged is lewd act upon a child. The second alleged molestation testified to by Gavin Arvizo. In count four, the crime alleged is lewd act upon a child. The first alleged molestation witnessed by Star Arvizo. In count five, the crime alleged is lewd act upon a child. The second alleged molestation witnessed by Star Arvizo. In count six, the crime alleged is attempt to commit a lewd act upon a child. In count seven, the crime alleged is administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, as alleged in count two. In count eight, the crime alleged is administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, as alleged in count three. In count nine, the crime alleged is administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, as alleged in count four. In count ten, the crime alleged is administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, as alleged in count 5. In addition to deciding if a defendant is guilty of the crime or crimes with which he is accused, you must also consider whether a defendant is guilty of any crime that is lesser to that charged. You will be more fully instructed on this subject later. However, in general, a defendant may be found guilty of a lesser crime if the jury unanimously concludes that the defendant, while not guilty of the crime charged, is guilty of a lesser crime. In this case, the counts with lesser charges are 1. In the counts 7 through 10, namely, administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, the lesser crime is furnishing alcohol to a minor, a misdemeanor. The word, willfully, when applied to the intent with which an act is done or omitted means with a purpose or willingness to commit the act or to make the omission in question. The word, willfully, does not require any intent to violate the law, or to injure another, or to acquire any advantage. The word, knowingly, means with knowledge of the existence of the facts in question. Knowledge of the unlawfulness of any act or omission is not required. To consent to an act or transaction, a person, 1. Must act freely and voluntarily and not under the influence of threats, force or duress. 2. Must have knowledge of the true nature of the act or transaction involved. And 3. Must possess the mental capacity to make an intelligent choice whether or not to do something proposed by another person. Merely being passive does not amount to consent. Consent requires a free will and positive cooperation in act or attitude. Evidence consists of testimony of witnesses, writings, material objects, or anything presented to the senses and offered to prove the existence or non-existence of a fact. Evidence is either direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is evidence that directly proves a fact. It is evidence which, by itself, 
if found to be true, establishes that fact. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that, if found to be true, proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. It is not necessary that facts be proved by direct evidence. They also may be proved by circumstantial evidence or by a combination of direct and circumstantial evidence. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as a means of proof. Neither is entitled to any greater weight than the other. However, a finding of guilt as to any crime may not be based on circumstantial evidence unless the proved circumstance are not only 1. Consistent with the theory that the defendant is guilty of the crime, but 2. Cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. Further, each fact which is essential to complete a set of circumstances necessary to establish the defendant's guilt must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, before an inference essential to establish guilt may be found to have been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, each fact or circumstance on which the inference necessarily rests must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, if the circumstantial evidence as to any particular count permits two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to the defendant's guilt and the other to his innocence, you must adopt that interpretation that points to the defendant's innocence, and reject that interpretation that points to his guilt. If, on the other hand, one interpretation of this evidence appears to you to be reasonable and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. The specific intent or mental state with which an act is done may be shown by the circumstances surrounding the commission of the act. However, you may not find the defendant guilty of the crimes charged unless the proved circumstances are not only 1. Consistent with the theory that the defendant had the required specific intent or mental state, but 2. Cannot be reconciled with any other rational conclusion. Also, if the evidence as to any specific intent or mental state permits two reasonable interpretations, one of which points to the existence of the specific intent or mental state and the other to its absence, you must adopt that interpretation which points to its absence. If, on the other hand, one interpretation of the evidence as to the specific intent or mental state appears to you to be reasonable and the other interpretation to be unreasonable, you must accept the reasonable interpretation and reject the unreasonable. Certain evidence was admitted for a limited purpose. At the time this evidence was admitted, you were instructed that it could not be considered by you for any purpose other than the limited purpose for which it was admitted. Do not consider this evidence for any purpose except the limited purpose for which it was admitted. You have been shown four different videotapes during the course of this proceeding. 1. Living with Michael Jackson, which has also been referred to as the Bashir video. 2. The Outtakes video, comprised of footage taken by Hamid Moslehi, Mr. Jackson's videographer. 3. The Rebuttal video made in response to the Bashir video and including comments from the Arvizo family, and, 4, the Sheriff's July 2003 interview with Gavin Arvizo. These videos are offered for limited purposes. The video of, Living with Michael Jackson, is not offered for the truth of anything said or shown in the program, with the exception of certain identified passages. You will receive additional instruction with regard to these identified passages. The rest of the video is hearsay and cannot be considered by you to prove anything other than the fact the program aired in February of 2003 and its likely impact, if any, on Mr. Jackson's state of mind. You should not be biased, prejudiced or influenced in any way by the content of the video or its commercial packaging. Except for the limited specific statements that will be identified in People's Exhibit 910, the remainder of the program should only be considered for the fact that it aired and its impact, if any, on Mr. Jackson. The outtakes video was offered to provide context for the statements made in the Bashir video. None of the statements in the outtakes video may be considered for their truth, unless they are identical to the identified passages you may consider from the Bashir video. The rebuttal video was offered by the defense to dispute the claim that Mr. Jackson or his co-conspirators scripted the statements made by members of the Arvizo family in that video. 
The video was offered so that you could observe the demeanor of the members of the Arvizo family and determine whether their statements were scripted. None of the statements made in the rebuttal video may be considered for their truth. The July 2003 interview of Gavin Arvizo was offered to rebut the claim that Gavin Arvizo's responses had been coached or scripted. The interview video was offered for the purpose of evaluating Gavin Arvizo's demeanor and assessing whether his responses were coached or scripted. None of the statements made in the interview video by Gavin Arvizo or the interviewers may be considered for their truth. As I just told you, certain identified passages from the video, living with Michael Jackson, have been offered for their truth as admissions. An admission is a statement made by the defendant which does not, by itself, acknowledge his guilt of the crimes for which the defendant is on trial, but which statement tends to prove his guilt when considered with the rest of the evidence. The statements that are being offered as admissions from the video, living with Michael Jackson, will be identified for you as the People's Exhibit No. 910. You are the exclusive judges as to whether the defendant made an admission, and if so, whether the statement is true in whole or in part. Evidence of an oral admission of the defendant not made in court should be viewed with caution. Neither side is required to call as witnesses all persons who may have been present at any of the events disclosed by the evidence or who may appear to have some knowledge of these events. Neither side is required to produce all objects or documents mentioned or suggested by the evidence. There has been evidence in this case indicating that a person other than a defendant was or may have been involved in the crime for which the defendant is on trial. There may be many reasons why that person is not here on trial. Therefore, do not speculate or guess as to why the other person is not being prosecuted in this trial or whether he has been or will be prosecuted. Your sole duty is to decide whether the people have proved the guilt of the defendant on trial. Evidence that at some other time a witness made statements that are inconsistent or consistent with his or her testimony in this trial may be considered by you not only for the purpose of testing the credibility of the witness, but also as evidence of the truth of the facts as stated by the witness on that former occasion. If you believe a witness's testimony that he or she no longer remembers a certain event, that testimony is inconsistent with a prior statement or statements by him or her describing that event. Every person who testifies under oath or affirmation as a witness, you are the sole judges of the believability of a witness and the weight to be given the testimony of each witness. In determining the believability of a witness, you may consider anything that has a tendency reasonably to prove or disprove the truthfulness of the testimony of the witness, including, but not limited to, any of the following. The extent of the opportunity or ability of the witness to see or hear or otherwise become aware of any matter about which the witness has testified. The ability of the witness to remember or to communicate any matter about which the witness has testified. The character and quality of that testimony. The demeanor and manner of the witness while testifying. The existence or non-existence of a bias, interest, or other motive. The existence or non-existence of any fact testified to by the witness. The attitude of the witness toward this action or toward the giving of testimony. A statement previously made by the witness that is consistent or inconsistent with his or her testimony. The character of the witness for honesty or truthfulness or their opposites. An admission by the witness of truthfulness. Past criminal conduct of a witness. Whether the witness is testifying under a grant of immunity. Discrepancies in a witness's testimony, or between a witness's testimony and that of other witnesses, if there were any, do not necessarily mean that any witness should be discredited. Failure of recollection is common. Innocent misrecollection is not uncommon. Two persons witnessing an incident or a transaction often will see or hear it differently. You should consider whether a discrepancy relates to an important matter or only to something trivial. A witness, who is willfully false in one material part of his or her testimony, is to be distrusted in others. You may reject the whole testimony of a witness who willfully has testified falsely as to a material point, unless, from all the evidence, you believe the probability of truth favors his or her testimony in other particulars. You are not required to decide any issue of fact in accordance with the testimony of a number of witnesses, which does not convince you as against the testimony of a lesser number or other evidence which you find more convincing. 
you may not disregard the testimony of the greater number of witnesses merely from caprice, whim or prejudice, or from a desire to favor one side against the other. You must not decide an issue by the simple process of counting the number of witnesses who have testified on the opposite sides. The final test is not in the relative numbers of witnesses, but in the convincing force of the evidence. Evidence has been introduced for the purpose of showing that a witness or witnesses engaged in past criminal conduct. This evidence may be considered by you only for the purpose of determining the believability of that witness. The fact that the witness engaged in past criminal conduct, if it is established, does not necessarily destroy or impair a witness's believability. It is one of the circumstances that you may consider in weighing the testimony of that witness. When a witness refuses to testify to any matter, relying on the constitutional privilege against self-incrimination, you must not draw from the exercise of this privilege any inference as to the believability of the witness or whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty or any other matter at issue in this trial. When a witness refuses to testify to any matter, relying upon the exercise of a lawful privilege, you must not draw from that fact any inference as to the believability of the witness or whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty or any other matter at issue in this trial. You should give the uncorroborated testimony of a single witness whatever weight you think it deserves. Testimony concerning any fact by one witness which you believe, whose testimony about that fact does not require corroboration, is sufficient for the proof of that fact. You should carefully review all the evidence upon which the proof of that fact depends. Evidence has been introduced for the purpose of showing that the defendant committed crimes other than that for which he is on trial. Except as you will otherwise be instructed, this evidence, if believed, may be considered by you only for the limited purpose of determining if it tends to show a characteristic method, plan or scheme in the commission of criminal acts similar to the method, plan or scheme used in the commission of the offense in this case which would further tend to show the existence of the intent which is a necessary element of the crime charged, the existence of the intent which is a necessary element of the crime charged, a motive for the commission of the crime charged, for the limited purpose for which you may consider such evidence, you must weigh it in the same manner as you do all other evidence in this case. Evidence has been introduced for the purpose of showing that the defendant engaged in a sexual offense on one or more occasions other than that charged in the case. Sexual offense means a crime under the laws of a state or of the United States that involves any conduct made criminal by Penal Code Section 288, and that should be a sub, a, with parentheses on the, a. The elements of this crime is set forth elsewhere in these instructions. If you find that the defendant committed a prior sexual offense, you may not, excuse me. If you find that the defendant committed a prior sexual offense, you may, but are not required to, infer that the defendant had a disposition to commit sexual offenses. If you find that the defendant had this disposition, you may, but are not required to, infer that he was likely to commit and did commit the crime or crimes of which he is accused. However, if you find by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant committed a prior sexual offense, or offenses, that is not sufficient by itself to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed the crimes charged. If you determine an inference properly can be drawn from this evidence, this inference is simply one item for you to consider, along with all other evidence, in determining whether the defendant has been proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the charged crime. Within the meaning of the preceding instructions, the prosecution has the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence that a defendant committed sexual offenses other than those for which he is on trial. You must not consider this evidence for any purpose unless you find by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant committed the other sexual offenses. If you find other crimes were committed by a preponderance of the evidence, you are nevertheless cautioned and reminded that before a defendant can be found guilty of any crime charged in this trial, the evidence as a whole must persuade you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of that crime. Preponderance of the evidence means evidence that has more convincing force than that opposed to it. If the evidence is so evenly balanced that you are unable to find that the evidence on either side of an issue preponderates, your finding on that issue must be against the party who had the burden of proving it. 
you should consider all of the evidence bearing upon every issue regardless of who produced it. Motive is not an element of the crime charged and need not be shown. However, you may consider motive or lack of motive as a circumstance in this case. Presence of motive may tend to establish the defendant as guilty. Absence of motive may tend to show the defendant as not guilty. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. You must not draw any inference from the fact that a defendant does not testify. Further, you must neither discuss this matter nor permit it to enter into your deliberations in any way. In deciding whether or not to testify, the defendant may choose to rely on the state of the evidence and upon the failure, if any, of the people to prove beyond a reasonable doubt every essential element of the charge against him. No lack of testimony on defendant's part will make up for a failure of proof by the people so as to support a finding against him on any essential element. An admission is a statement made by the defendant which does not, by itself, acknowledge his guilt of the crimes for which the defendant is on trial, but which statement tends to prove his guilt when considered with the rest of the evidence. You are the exclusive judges as to whether the defendant made an admission, and if so, whether the statement is true in whole or in part. Evidence of an oral admission of the defendant not made in court should be viewed with caution. Evidence has been received from which you may find that an oral statement of intent was made by the defendant before the offense with which he is charged was committed. It is for you to decide whether the statement was made by the defendant. Evidence of an oral statement ought to be viewed with caution. No person may be convicted of a criminal offense unless there is some proof of each element of the crime independent of any admission made by him outside the trial. The identity of the person who is alleged to have committed a crime is not an element of the crime. The identity may be established by an admission. Witnesses who have special knowledge, skill, experience, training or education in a particular subject have testified to certain opinions. This type of witness is referred to as an expert witness. In determining what weight to give to any opinion expressed by an expert witness, you should consider the qualifications and believability of the witness, the facts or materials upon which each opinion is based, and the reasons for each opinion. An opinion is only as good as the facts and reasons on which it is based. If you find that any fact has not been proved, or has been disproved, you must consider that in determining the value of the opinion. Likewise, you must consider the strengths and weaknesses of the reasons on which it is based. You are not bound by an opinion. Give each opinion the weight you find it deserves. You may disregard any opinion if you find it to be unreasonable. In determining the weight to be given to an opinion expressed by any witness who did not testify as an expert witness, you should consider his or her believability, the extent of his or her opportunity to perceive the matters upon which his or her opinion is based and the reasons, if any, given for it. You are not required to accept an opinion, but should give it the weight, if any, to which you find it entitled. In examining an expert witness, counsel may ask a hypothetical question. This is a question in which the witness is asked to assume the truth of a set of facts and to give an opinion based on that assumption. In permitting this type of question, the court does not rule and does not necessarily find that all of the assumed facts have been proved. It only determines that those assumed facts are within the possible range of the evidence. It is for you to decide from the evidence whether or not the facts assumed in a hypothetical question have been proved. If you should decide that any assumption in a question has not been proved, you are to determine the effect of that failure of proof on the value and weight of the expert opinion based on the assumed facts. In resolving any conflict that may exist in the testimony of expert witnesses, you should weigh the opinion of one expert against that of another. In doing this, you should consider the qualifications and believability of each witness, the reasons for each opinion and the matter upon which it is based. A defendant in a criminal action is presumed to be innocent until the contrary is proved, and in case of a reasonable doubt whether his guilt is satisfactorily shown, he is entitled to a verdict of not guilty. This presumption places upon the people the burden of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is defined as follows. It is not a mere possible doubt, because everything relating to human affairs is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. 
it is that state of the case which, after the entire comparison and consideration of all the evidence, leaves the minds of the jurors in that condition that they cannot say they feel an abiding conviction of the truth of the charge. In the crimes charged in counts 1 through 10, there must exist a union or joint operation of act or conduct and a certain specific intent in the mind of the perpetrator. Unless this specific intent exists, the crime to which it relates is not committed. The specific intent required is included in the definitions of the crimes set forth elsewhere in these instructions. The crime of conspiracy, as alleged in count 1, requires the specific intent to agree to commit a crime and a further specific intent to commit that crime. The crime of lewd act with a child under 14 years of age, as alleged in counts 2, 3, 4 and 5, requires the specific intent to arouse, appeal to, or gratify the lusts or passions or sexual desires of the perpetrator or the child. The crime of attempted lewd act with a child under 14 years of age, as alleged in count 6, requires the specific intent to commit a lewd act with a child under 14 years of age and the specific intent to arouse, appeal to, or gratify the lusts or passions or sexual desires of the perpetrator or the child. The crime of administering an intoxicating agent to another, as alleged in count 7, 8, 9 and 10, requires the specific intent thereby to enable or assist the perpetrator to commit a felony. In the crimes charged in counts 1 through 10, or lesser crimes thereto, there must exist a union or joint operation of act or conduct and a certain mental state in the mind of the perpetrator. Unless this mental state exists, the crime to which it relates is not committed. The mental states required are included in the definitions of the crimes set forth elsewhere in these instructions. Defendant is accused in count one of having committed the crime of conspiracy, a violation of section 182 of the Penal Code, on or about a period of time between February 1, 2003, and March 31, 2003. Defendant is accused in counts two through five of having committed the crime of lewd act upon a child, a violation of Penal Code section 288, subdivision, A, on or about a period of time between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003. Defendant is accused in count 6 of having attempted to commit the crime of lewd act upon a child, a violation of Penal Code Section 664 and 288, subdivision, A, on or about a period of time between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003. Defendant is accused in count 7 through 10 of administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, in violation of Penal Code Section 222, on or about a period of time between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003. In order to find the defendant guilty of the crime charged against him in a particular count, it is necessary for the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the commission of a specific act or acts constituting that crime within the period alleged. And, in order to find the defendant guilty of the crime charged against him in a particular count, you must unanimously agree upon the commission of the same specific act or acts constituting that crime within the period alleged. It is not necessary that the particular act or acts committed, so agreed upon, be stated in the verdict. An attempt to commit a crime consists of two elements, namely, a specific intent to commit the crime, and a direct but ineffectual act done toward its commission. In determining whether this act was done, it is necessary to distinguish between mere preparation on the one hand, and the actual commencement of the doing of the criminal deed on the other. Mere preparation, which may consist of planning the offense or of devising, obtaining or arranging the means for its commission is not sufficient to constitute an attempt. However, acts of a person who intends to commit a crime will constitute an attempt where those acts clearly indicate a certain, unambiguous intent to commit that specific crime. These acts must be an immediate step in the present execution of the criminal design, the progress of which would be completed unless interrupted by some circumstance not intended in the original design. You know, I read to my wife at night so she'll go to sleep. I'm not having that effect here, huh? Laughter. Okay. A conspiracy, as charged in count one of the indictment, 
is an agreement entered into between two or more persons with the specific intent to agree to commit the crime of child abduction, false imprisonment, or extortion, and with the further specific intent to commit that crime or crimes, followed by an overt act committed in this state by one or more of the parties for the purpose of accomplishing the object of the agreement. Conspiracy as a crime. In order to find a defendant guilty of conspiracy, in addition to proof of the unlawful agreement and specific intent, there must be proof of the commission of at least one of the acts alleged in the indictment to be an overt act and that the act found to have been committed was an overt act. It is not necessary to the guilt of the defendant that he personally committed an overt act if he was one of the conspirators when the alleged overt act was committed. The term, overt act means any step taken or act committed by one or more of the conspirators which goes beyond mere planning or agreement to commit a crime and which step or act is done in furtherance of the accomplishment of the object of the conspiracy. To be an overt act, the step taken or act committed need not, in and of itself, constitute the crime or even an attempt to commit the crime which is the ultimate object of the conspiracy. Nor is it required that the step or act, in and of itself, be criminal or an unlawful act. Each member of a criminal conspiracy is liable for each act and bound by each declaration of every other member of the conspiracy if that act or declaration is in furtherance of the object of the conspiracy. The act of one conspirator pursuant to or in furtherance of the common design of the conspiracy is the act of all conspirators. A member of a conspiracy is not only guilty of the particular crime that to his knowledge his confederates agreed to and did commit, but is also liable for the natural and probable consequences of any crime or act of a co-conspirator to further the object of the conspiracy, even though that crime or act was not intended as a part of the agreed-upon objective and even though he was not present at the time of the commission of that crime or act. You must determine whether the defendant is guilty as a member of a conspiracy to commit the originally agreed-upon crime or crimes, and, if so, whether the crimes alleged in count one was perpetrated by co-conspirators in furtherance of that conspiracy and was a natural and probable consequence of the agreed-upon criminal objective of that conspiracy. In determining whether a consequence is natural and probable, you must apply an objective test based on what the defendant actually intended, excuse me. In determining whether a consequence is natural and probable, you must apply an objective test based not on what the defendant actually intended, but on what a person of reasonable and ordinary prudence would have expected would be likely to occur. The issue is to be decided in light of all of the circumstances surrounding the incident. A natural consequence is one which is within the normal range of outcomes that may be reasonably expected to occur if nothing unusual has intervened. Probable means likely to happen. The formation and existence of a conspiracy may be inferred from all circumstances tending to show that the common intent and may be proved in the same way as any other fact may be proved, either by direct testimony of the fact or by circumstantial evidence, or by both direct and circumstantial evidence. It is not necessary to show a meeting of the alleged conspirators or the making of an express or formal agreement. Evidence that a person was in the company of or associated with one or more other persons alleged or proved to have been members of a conspiracy is not, in itself, sufficient to prove that person was a member of the alleged conspiracy. It is not a defense to the crime of conspiracy that an alleged conspirator did not know all the other conspirators. The members of a conspiracy may be widely separated geographically and yet may be in agreement on a criminal design and may act in concert in pursuit of that design. The adoption by a person of the criminal design and criminal intent entertained in common by others and of its object and purposes is all that is necessary to make that person a co-conspirator when the required elements of a conspiracy are present. Where a conspirator commits an act or makes a declaration which is neither in furtherance of the object of the conspiracy nor the natural and probable consequence of an attempt to attain that object, he alone is responsible for and bound by that act or declaration, and no criminal responsibility therefore attaches to any of his confederates. The act or declaration of a person who is not a member of a conspiracy is not binding upon the members of the conspiracy even if the act or declaration tended to promote the object of the conspiracy. Evidence of the commission of an act which furthered the purpose of an alleged conspiracy is not, in itself, 
sufficient to prove that the person committing the act was a member of the alleged conspiracy. Every person who joins a conspiracy after its formation is liable for and bound by the acts committed and declarations made by other members in pursuance and furtherance of the conspiracy during the time that he is a member of the conspiracy. A person who joins a conspiracy after its formation is not liable or bound by the acts of the co-conspirators or for any crime committed by the co-conspirators before that person joins and becomes a member of the conspiracy. Evidence of any acts done or declarations made by other conspirators prior to the time that person becomes a member of the conspiracy may be considered by you in determining the nature, objectives and purposes of the conspiracy, but for no other purpose. A member of a conspiracy is liable for the acts and declarations of his co-conspirators until he effectively withdraws from the conspiracy or the conspiracy has terminated. In order to effectively withdraw from a conspiracy, there must be an affirmative and good faith rejection or repudiation of the conspiracy which must be communicated to the other conspirators of whom he has knowledge. If a member of a conspiracy has effectively withdrawn from the conspiracy, he is not thereafter liable for any act of the co-conspirators committed after his withdrawal from the conspiracy, but he is not relieved of responsibility for the acts of his co-conspirators committed while he was a member. No act or declaration of a conspirator committed or made after the conspiracy has been terminated is binding upon co-conspirators, and they are not criminally liable for that act. The defendant in this case is entitled to, and must receive, your determination whether he was a member of the alleged conspiracy. You must determine whether he was a conspirator by deciding whether he willfully, intentionally and knowingly joined with any other or others in the alleged conspiracy. Before you may return a guilty verdict of the crime of conspiracy as charged in count one, you must unanimously agree and find beyond a reasonable doubt that, one, there was a conspiracy to commit more, excuse me, there was a conspiracy to commit one or more of the crimes of extortion, child abuse and false imprisonment, and two, the defendant willfully, intentionally and knowingly joined with any other or others in the alleged conspiracy. You must also unanimously agree and find beyond a reasonable doubt that an overt act was committed by one of the conspirators. You are not required to unanimously agree as to who committed an overt act, or which overt act was committed, so long as each of you finds beyond a reasonable doubt that one of the conspirators committed one of the acts alleged in the indictment to be overt acts. In this case the defendant is charged with conspiracy to commit the following public crimes. 1 a violation of Penal Code Section 278, child abduction, a felony. 2. A violation of Penal Code Section 236, false imprisonment, a felony. 3. A violation of Penal Code Section 518, extortion, a felony. It is alleged that the following acts were committed in this state by one or more of the defendants and were overt acts and committed for the purpose of furthering the object of the conspiracy. Overt Act No. 1. On or about February 4, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson told Janet Arvizo that the lives of her children, Gavin, Starr and Develine Arvizo, were in danger due to the recent broadcast on British television of the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, in which Gavin Arvizo appears with Michael Joe Jackson. Michael Joe Jackson did tell Janet Arvizo that she and her three children would be flown to Miami to participate in a press conference, which press conference never took place. Overt Act No. 2. On and between February 4, 2003, and February 5, 2003, the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, in which Gavin Arvizo appears, was broadcast in the United States. Michael Joe Jackson did personally prevent the Arvizo family from viewing the program while at the Turnberry Resort Hotel in Miami, Florida. Overt Act No. 3. On and between February 7, 2003, and February 8, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson did return the Arvizo family to Santa Barbara in a private jet. On the flight, Michael Joe Jackson did sit with Gavin Arvizo and did give him an alcoholic beverage, concealed in a soft drink can. Michael Joe Jackson did then present Gavin Arvizo with a wristwatch. Michael Joe Jackson did tell Gavin Arvizo that the watch was worth $75,000. Michael Joe Jackson did tell Gavin Arvizo not to tell anyone about them drinking alcoholic beverages together. 
Overt Act No. 4. On or about February 8, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson brought the Arvizo family to Jackson's Neverland Ranch, where Gavin, Starr, Develine and Janet Arvizo remained for approximately five days. Overt Act No. 5. On and between February 6, 2003, and February 12, 2003, in both Miami, Florida, and at Neverland Ranch in Santa Barbara County, Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner did tell Janet Arvizo that there were death threats made against her and her children by unknown individuals. They did further tell Janet Arvizo that the only way to assure the safety of her family was for the Arvizos to participate in the making of a rebuttal video favorable to Michael Joe Jackson. Overt Act No. 6. On and between February 12, 2003, and February 15, 2003, after the Arvizo family had departed Neverland Ranch in the night, Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, did telephone Janet Arvizo and urge her to return with her children to Neverland Ranch and did say, I know Michael would love for you to come back to the ranch, for the safety of all concerned, and, now is not the right time to be out there alone, and, never turn your back on Michael, and, Michael wants to see you and the family, and, you need to go back to the ranch and see Michael, because he is very concerned, and, even staying another night alone is not safe. Frank Cassio, aka Frank Tyson, did tell Janet Arvizo that, we would love for you to go on tape and just say something beautiful about Michael. Frank Cassio did assure Janet Arvizo and Gavin Arvizo that Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner would no longer be present at the ranch if they returned. He did state, they are not there. I know that for a fact. Overt Act No. 7. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, did threaten Star Arvizo that Cassio did have ways to make Star Arvizo's grandparents disappear. Frank Cassio did tell Gavin Arvizo, I could have your mother killed. Overt Act No. 8. On or about February 14, 2003, and February 15, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson's personal chauffeur, Gary Hearn, did drive to Janet Arvizo's Los Angeles residence and did transport her and her children back to Neverland Ranch in Santa Barbara County. Overt Act No. 9. On and between February 14, 2003, and February 15, 2003, upon the Arvizo family's return to Neverland Ranch, Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner were, in fact, present, whereupon Janet Arvizo asked to leave with her children. Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner did tell Janet Arvizo that she was free to depart. However, her children must remain at the ranch. Overt Act No. 10. During the month of February 2003, in Santa Barbara County, California, Michael Joe Jackson's personal security staff was directed in writing not to allow Gavin Arvizo to leave Neverland Ranch. Overt Act No. 11. During the month of February 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel, Christian Robinson and an unknown attorney did prepare a script of questions to be asked of the Arvizo family during the filming of the rebuttal video by Hamid Moslehi. Gee, I need a drink of water. I'll try that one again. During the month of February 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel, Christian Robinson, and an unknown attorney did prepare a script of questions to be asked of the Arvizo family during the filming of the rebuttal video by Hamid Moslehi, Michael Joe Jackson's personal videographer. Overt Act No. 12. On or about February 19, 2003, the Arvizo children were transported by Hamid Moslehi from Neverland Ranch to Moslehi's home in the San Fernando Valley, and on the same date, Vinny Amen did transport Janet Arvizo to Hamid Moslehi's residence for the filming of the rebuttal video. Overt Act No. 13. On or about February 19, 2003, and February 20, 2003, in Los Angeles County, between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., the employees and associates of Michael Joe Jackson did tape the rebuttal video, an interview of the Arvizo family, in the presence of Vinny Amen and Bradley Miller, a licensed private investigator. During the taping, previously scripted questions were asked of the Arvizo family. Overt Act No. 14. On or about February 20, 2003, 
Vinny A. Men did transport Janet Arvizo to Norwalk, in Los Angeles County, to obtain birth certificates of the Arvizo family for the purpose of obtaining passports and visas to travel to Brazil. Overt Act No. 15. On and between February 25, 2003, and March 2, 2003, Vinny A. Men did take the Arvizo family from Neverland Ranch to the Country Inn and Suites in Calabasas, Los Angeles County. Vinny A. Men did transport Janet Arvizo to public offices in Los Angeles County where passports showing the destinations of Italy and France and visas for the entrance to Brazil for the Arvizo family were obtained. Frederick Mark Schaffel, business partner of Michael Joe Jackson and president of Neverland Valley Entertainment, did pay expenses in connection with this activity. Overt Act No. 16. On or about February 25, 2003. Frederick Mark Schaffel did make airline reservations for the Arvizo family to travel to Brazil on March 3, 2003. Overt Act No. 17. On or about February 26, 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel paid Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, $1,000 in connection with vacation expenses for the Arvizo family. Overt Act No. 18. On or about February 27, 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel did pay Vinnie Amen the sum of $500 cash for costs related to the Brazilian visas of the Arvizo family. Overt Act No. 19. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at the Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did have Gavin Arvizo sleep in his bedroom and in his bed. Overt Act No. 20. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did house Janet and Develine Arvizo in a guest cottage on Neverland Ranch, where Janet and Develine Arvizo slept. Overt Act No. 21. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did show sexually explicit materials to Gavin and Star Arvizo. Overt Act No. 22. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did drink alcoholic beverages in the presence of Gavin and Star Arvizo and provided alcoholic beverages to them. Overt Act No. 23. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, Michael Joe Jackson did monitor and maintain control over the activities at Neverland Ranch by means of multiple interior door locks, proximity sensor alarm devices, and a keypad combination lock as well as video and telephone surveillance equipment. Michael Joe Jackson did personally monitor telephone conversations of Janet Arvizo without her knowledge or permission. Overt Act No. 24. On or about March 1, 2003, Vinnie A. Men did pay the rent on the residence of the Arvizo family in Los Angeles County and moved their belongings into storage. Overt Act No. 25. On or about March 6, 2003, Vinnie Amen did go to John Burroughs Middle School in Los Angeles County and he did withdraw Gavin and Star Arvizo from their enrollment there, telling school authorities that the children were relocating to Phoenix, Arizona. Overt Act No. 26. On or about March 9, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson was told by Gavin Arvizo that Gavin Arvizo had a medical appointment the following day at which time he was to give the medical staff a 24-hour-long urine collection specimen for laboratory analysis. Michael Joe Jackson, in Santa Barbara County, did tell Gavin Arvizo to cancel the appointment, because the sample would reveal that Gavin Arvizo had been consuming alcoholic beverages while staying at Neverland Ranch. On or about March 10, 2003, in Los Angeles County, after Janet Arvizo refused to cancel the medical appointment and while on the way to the medical appointment, Vinnie A. Men did destroy most of Gavin Arvizo's collected urine specimen, intended for laboratory analysis in connection with Gavin Arvizo's follow-up treatment for the disease of cancer. Overt Act No. 27. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, in Los Angeles County, and as revealed by a surveillance videotape located on November 18, 2003, in the office of private investigator Bradley Miller, an unknown co-conspirator conducted video surveillance of Gavin Arvizo and various members of Gavin Arvizo's family, including his grandmother and grandfather, his mother, his mother's boyfriend, 
his brother and his sister, at and near their respective residences and elsewhere. Overt Act No. 28. On or about March 31, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson did direct Frederick Mark Schaffel to pay Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, the sum of $1 million from Petty Cash of Neverland Valley Entertainment on behalf of Michael Joe Jackson. Evidence of a statement made by one alleged conspirator other than at this trial shall not be considered by you as against another alleged conspirator unless you determine by a preponderance of the evidence. 1 that from other independent evidence that at the time the statement was made a conspiracy to commit a crime existed. 2. That the statement was made while the person making the statement was participating in the conspiracy and that the person against whom it was offered was participating in the conspiracy before or during that time. And 3. That that statement was made in furtherance of the objective of the conspiracy. The word, statement as used in this instruction includes any oral or written verbal expression or the nonverbal conduct of a person intended by that person as a substitute for oral or written verbal expression. Defendant is charged in count one with conspiracy to commit the crime of extortion. In violation of Penal Code Section 518, the crime of child abduction, in violation of Penal Code Section 278, and the crime of false imprisonment in violation of Penal Code Section 236. In order to find the defendant guilty of the crime of conspiracy, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant conspired to commit one or more of the crimes, and you also must unanimously agree as to which particular crime or crimes he conspired to commit. If you find the defendant guilty of conspiracy, you will then include a finding on the question as to which such alleged crimes you unanimously agree the defendant conspired to commit. A form will be supplied to you for that purpose. Defendant is accused in count one of having conspired to commit the crime of false imprisonment by violence or menace, a violation of section 236 of the Penal Code. Every person who, by violence or menace, violates the liberty of another person by intentionally and unlawfully restraining, confining or detaining that person and compelling that person to stay or go somewhere without his or her consent is guilty of the crime of false imprisonment by violence or menace, in violation of Penal Code Section 236. Violence means the exercise of physical force used to restrain over and above the force reasonably necessary to effect the restraint. Menace means a threat of harm, express or implied, by word or act. False imprisonment does not require that there be confinement in a jail or prison. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. 1. A person intentionally and unlawfully restrained, confined, or detained another person, compelling him or her to stay or go somewhere. 2. The other person did not consent to the restraint, confinement, or detention. And 3. The restraint, confinement or detention was accomplished by violence or menace. In the crime of false imprisonment, there must exist a union or joint operation of act or conduct and general criminal intent. General criminal intent does not require an intent to violate the law. When a person intentionally does that which the law declares to be a crime, he is acting with general criminal intent, even though he may not know that his act or conduct is unlawful. However, before a person can be convicted of conspiracy to commit false imprisonment, the specific intents to commit conspiracy must be proved. Defendant is accused in count one of having conspired to commit the crime of child abduction, a violation of section 278 of the Penal Code. Every person, not having a right of custody, who maliciously takes and entices away, keeps, withholds or conceals any child with the specific intent to detain or conceal the child from a lawful custodian is guilty of the crime of child abduction, in violation of Penal Code Section 278. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. 1. A person took, enticed away, kept, withheld, or concealed a child. 2. That person did not have a right of custody of the child. 3 that person acted maliciously, and four, with the specific intent to detain or conceal the child from a lawful custodian. As used in the crime of child abduction, child means a person under the age of 18. Maliciously means with intent to vex, annoy or injure another person, 
or to do a wrongful act. Fraudulently includes all surprise, trick, cunning, and unfair ways by which one person deceives or attempts to deceive another. Keeps or withholds means retains physical possession of a child whether or not the child resists or objects. To entice means to allure, to attract, to draw on, or to lead astray by exciting hope or desire. It does not necessarily include any domination over the child's will. Detain means to delay, to hinder, or to retard. It does not necessarily include force or menace. Lawful custodian means a person, guardian or public agency having a right to custody of a child. Abduct means take, entice away, keep, withhold, or conceal. The fact that a minor child decided to go, or to stay, or decided voluntarily to accompany an adult is not a defense to the crime of unlawfully taking, obtaining, concealing, or enticing away a minor child. Defendant is accused in counts 2, 3, 4 and 5 of having committed the crime of lewd act with a child, in violation of section 288, subdivision, A, of the Penal Code. Every person who willfully commits any lewd or lascivious act upon or with the body, or any part or member thereof, of a child under the age of 14 years, with the specific intent of arousing, appealing to, or gratifying the lust or passions or sexual desires of that person or that child, is guilty of the crime of committing a lewd or lascivious act upon the body of a child, in violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, A. A lewd or lascivious act is defined as any touching of the body of a child under the age of 14 years with the specific intent to arouse, appeal to, or gratify the sexual desires of either party. To constitute a lewd or lascivious act, it is not necessary that the bare skin be touched. The touching may be through the clothing of the child. The law does not require as an essential element of the crime that the lust, passions, or sexual desires of either of such persons be actually aroused, appealed to, or gratified. It is no defense to this charge that a child under the age of 14 years may have consented to the alleged lewd or lascivious act. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. A person touched the body of a child. The child was under 14 years of age. And, three, the touching was done with the specific intent to arouse, appeal to, or gratify the lust, passions or sexual desires of that person or the child. It is not essential to a finding of guilt on a charge of lewd acts with a child under the age of 14 years that the testimony of the witness with whom the sexual relations is alleged to have been committed be corroborated by other evidence. Is it time for a break? I think so. We're very close, but let's take a break. All right, evidence has been presented to you concerning child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. This evidence is not received and must not be considered by you as proof that the alleged victim's molestation claim is true. Child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome research is based upon an approach that is completely different from that which you must take to this case. The syndrome research begins with the assumption that a molestation has occurred and seeks to describe and explain common reactions of children to that experience. As distinguished from the research approach, you are to presume the defendant innocent. The people have the burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. You should consider the evidence concerning the syndrome and its effect only for the limited purpose of showing, if it does, that the alleged victim's reactions, as demonstrated by the evidence, are not inconsistent with him having been molested. Defendant is accused in count one of having conspired to violate 518 of the Penal Code. Every person who obtains property or other things of value from another with his or her consent, which consent has been induced by a wrongful use of fear, is guilty of the crime of extortion, in violation of Penal Code Section 518. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. 1. A person obtained property or something of value from the alleged victim. 2. The property or thing of value was obtained with the consent of the alleged victim. 3. The alleged victim's consent was induced by the wrongful use of fear. And 4. 
the person who wrongfully used fear did so with the specific intent to induce the alleged victim to consent to the giving up of his or her property or thing of value. The terms property and something of value, as used in the law of extortion, include both tangible and intangible property to which a monetary value can be found. Intangible property includes every benefit and legal right belonging to a person and susceptible of being enjoyed, exercised or disposed of by him or her. Examples include a person's personal identification number, PIN number, for access to his or her bank account, or a person's right to pursue available legal remedies and a person's exclusive right to make use of his or her name or likeness for commercial purposes. Fear may be induced by a threat to inflict an unlawful injury on the person threatened or a third person. The words, unlawful injury, mean an injury which, if inflicted, would create civil liability against the person doing it and would support a civil action against the person. A threat to do that which one has a legal right to do is not a threat to do an unlawful injury. To constitute extortion, the fear induced by the threat must be the operating or inducing cause which produces consent and results in the property or other thing of value being delivered to another. If some other cause is the primary and controlling cause for the consent to the property or thing of value being delivered to another, the crime of extortion has not been proved. As used in the law of extortion, Consent is obtained from the person threatened when property or other thing of value is turned over to another with the understanding that the person threatened will be saved from injury to the person threatened or a third person. The delivery of the property or other thing of value is the lesser of two unpleasant alternatives. Consent, as used in the law of extortion, exists under these circumstances notwithstanding the fact that the person threatened may violently protest in his or her own mind against the circumstances which compel the choice. A coerced and unwilling consent compelled by the wrongful use of force or fear constitutes consent in extortion. Defendant is accused in count 7, 8, 9 and 10 of having committed the crime of administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony. Any person who administers to another any intoxicating agent with the intent to enable or assist himself or any other person to commit a felony is guilty of the crime of administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. 1. Administers to another any intoxicating agent. 2. With the specific intent to enable or assist himself or any other person to commit a felony. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the crime charged, you may nevertheless convict him of any lesser crime if you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the lesser crime. The crime of furnishing alcohol to a minor is lesser to that of administering an intoxicating agent as charged in count 7 through 10. Thus, you are to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the crimes charged in 7 through 10 or of any lesser crimes. In doing so, you have discretion to choose the order in which you evaluate each crime and consider the evidence pertaining to it. You may find it productive to consider and reach a tentative conclusion on all charges and lesser crimes before reaching any final verdict. However, the court cannot accept a guilty verdict on a lesser crime unless you have unanimously found the defendant not guilty of the charged greater crime. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the crime of which is he accused in count 7, 8, 9 and 10, and you unanimously so find, you may convict him of any lesser crime provided you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty of that crime. You will be provided with guilty and not guilty verdict forms for the crime charged in count 7, 8, 9 and 10, and the lesser crime thereto. The crime of furnishing an alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years is a lesser crime to that of administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony. Thus, you are to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the crime charged in count 7, 8, 9 or 10 or of any lesser crime. In doing so, you have discretion to choose the order in which you evaluate each crime and consider the evidence pertaining to it. You may find it to be productive to consider and reach tentative conclusions on all charged and lesser crimes before reaching any final verdicts. 
Disregard the instructions previously given which requires that you return but one verdict form as to count 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. Before you return any final or formal verdict, you must be guided by the following. 1. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of the crime of which he is accused in count 7, 8, 9 and 10, your foreperson shall sign and date the corresponding verdict form. All other verdict forms as to count 7, 8, 9 and 10 must be left unsigned. 2. If you are unable to reach a unanimous verdict as to the crime of which the defendant is accused in count 7, 8, 9 or 10, do not sign any verdict form as to the count or counts as to which you are in disagreement and report your disagreement to the court. 3. The court cannot accept a guilty verdict on a lesser crime unless the jury also unanimously finds and returns a signed verdict form of not guilty as to the charged greater crime. 4. If you unanimously agree and find the defendant not guilty of the crime with which he is charged in count 7, 8, 9 or 10, but cannot reach a unanimous agreement as to the lesser crime, your foreperson should sign and date the not guilty verdict form as to the charged crime and report your disagreement as to the lesser crimes to the court. Every person who unlawfully sells, furnishes, gives or causes to be sold, furnished or given away any alcoholic beverage to any person under the age of 21 is guilty of a violation of Business and Professions Code Section 25658, Subdivision, A, a misdemeanor. In order to prove this crime, each of the following elements must be proved. 1. Defendant Michael Jackson furnished, gave or caused to be furnished or given away an alcoholic beverage to Gavin Arvizo. And, 2. Gavin Arvizo was under the age of 21 years. In the crime of furnishing an alcoholic beverage to a person under 21 years, which is a lesser crime of the crime charged in count 7, 8, 9 and 10 of the indictment, there must exist a union or joint operation of act or conduct and general criminal intent. General criminal intent does not require an intent to violate the law. When a person intentionally does that which the law declares to be a crime, he is acting with general criminal intent even though he may not know that his act or conduct is unlawful. The defendant is accused of having committed the crime of a lewd act upon a child under 14 in counts 2 through 5. Similarly, the defendant is accused in count 6 of having attempted to commit the crime of a lewd act upon a child. Also, the defendant is accused in count 7 through 10 of having committed the crime of administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony or the lesser included offense of furnishing alcohol to a minor. The prosecution has introduced evidence for the purpose of showing that there is more than one act upon which a conviction for each count may be based. Defendant may be found guilty if the proof shows beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed any one or more of the acts. However, in order to return a verdict of guilty as to any individual count, all jurors must agree that he committed the same act or acts. It is not necessary that the particular act agreed upon be stated in your verdict. Each count charges a distinct crime. You must decide each count separately. The defendant may be found guilty or not guilty of any or all of the crimes charged in counts 1 through 10. Your finding as to each count must be stated in a separate verdict. It is further alleged that at the time of the commission of the crimes charged in counts 2 through 5, that the victim in the above offenses, Gavin Arvizo, was under the age of 14 years and that the defendant had substantial sexual conduct with Gavin Arvizo. If you find the defendant guilty of the crimes charged in counts 2 through 5, you must determine whether or not the truth of this allegation has been proved. Substantial sexual conduct means masturbation of either the victim or the defendant. The people have the burden of proving the truth of this allegation. If you have a reasonable doubt that it is true, you must find it to be not true. Include a special finding on that question using a form that will be supplied to you. In your deliberations, do not discuss or consider the subject of penalty or punishment. That subject must not in any way affect your verdict. The purpose of the court's instructions is to provide you with the applicable law so that you may arrive at a just and lawful verdict. Whether some of the instructions apply will depend upon what you find to be the facts. Disregard any instruction which applies to facts determined by you not to exist.
Do not conclude that because an instruction has been given, I am expressing an opinion as to the facts. All right, that's all of the instructions you're going to hear today. And after argument, I have just three or four or six, you know, a very small summary of concluding instructions, which I will provide you copies of at that time. So I'm going to excuse you now, have you return at 8.30, and we will hear the final arguments. Have a good evening. Is there any reason not to recess for today? No, Your Honor. All right, courts in recess.